Hello, I'm Ira Bedzo, and this is The Good Life, a show that talks about all aspects of human flourishing, from physical and mental health to social and spiritual well-being. I want to thank our sponsors for the show, the Restoring Religious Freedom Project at Emory University School of Law and Shlomo's Restaurant at the base of Aspen Mountain. The topic of today's show is, where do moral beliefs come from and how do we act on them? And I will be speaking with Mary Gentile, who is the creator and director of Giving Voice to Values, professor of practice at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business, and senior advisor at the Aspen Institute's Business and Society Program. Before we begin discussing the details of where we get our moral beliefs and how we can act on them, let's break down the issue to give some background and set the stage. Living ethically is about both moral thinking and moral action. The two are distinct, with different skills needed to do either well. Having one set of skills does not necessarily entail that you have the other. For example, there's been a book called Lost in Transition, Transition, The Dark Side of Emerging Adulthood, where the authors discuss the results of interviews with a number of young adults to, de to determine which issues they were facing. The interviewees were able to think about ethics in the abstract and use moral reasoning in cases where they can discuss, but then when the interviewers asked them questions about what they did in their actual lives, they didn't rely on the same moral reasoning. Moreover, the way they justified their actions was based on what they would usually do in a situation or how they felt about a situation. This disconnect between their ability to reason in the abstract and their inability to apply ethical thinking to their own lives is oftentimes called the moral gap between thinking and acting. In order to come up with a moral decision and to act on it, people must think about how to evaluate different moral choices as well as the personal and situational factors that affect what choices one can implement. Coming up with the right answer of what should be done does not easily translate to the right answer of what I can do. Moreover, just like anything else that takes skill, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. People must act on their moral choices habitually so as to develop their mm -hmm. skills. Small acts of engagement train people to undertake big acts of commitment. Only through using our everyday life experience as a way to develop our ethical skills can we build a bridge between our big picture notion of ethics and our everyday acting. Only then will, will, will we be able to cross that moral gap. With this setting of the stage, let's hear how a leader in the field navigates these debates and where our moral values come from and how we can better act on them. Mary, tell me about giving voice to values and its premise and how you created the content. Thanks, Ira. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So giving voice to values, actually, I like to tell people it grew out of um, my own personal crisis of faith. Um, I had been working um, in the field of business ethics um, and uh, values-driven leadership development for several decades. I worked at Harvard Business School to help with the development of their first required curriculum around ethics and business. And then I worked with other business schools and companies. And uh, a number of years ago, around the, the turn of the last century, I had uh, what I call this crisis of faith. And I began to think that maybe trying to talk about ethics and business was unethical. <laughs> you know, it seemed that um, no matter what we did, every few years there would be another spate of scandals. And um, the other thing that I saw, uh, which really contributed to this sense that, that you know, maybe this was futile, was that when I saw people in conversations, whether it was in the business school classroom or in companies themselves, and we were trying to talk about ethics and values, and we'd usually give them some thorny ethical dilemma, and people would come into the conversation with an idea of what they thought the right thing to do was, but then in the course of the conversation, two things would happen. The first thing that would happen is their thinking would become more complex. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing, right? You don't want people to be naive. But on, and to assume that just because they think it's right or wrong, everyone will agree. But the second thing that happened was more troubling. Um, I would find, I don't know if you find this, but I would find that in classrooms or in organizations, there were usually a few people that when they spoke, everyone would turn and listen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they were the, the highest ranked person in the room. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were the wittiest, you know. Um, sometimes they were just the people who would communicate a very complex idea very simply and in a pithy way. But for whatever reason, those people, the ones that everyone listened to, would be the ones who would be saying, Mary, I know what you, what you want me to say. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, it's just not possible. So I felt that people were walking out of these conversations 
more confused and less empowered because the people they listened to were the ones who were saying it's not possible to act on this. The ones who were giving the message that if you're sophisticated and, and knowing, you wouldn't actually even try. Um, so for all those reasons, I had this crisis of faith and I took a step back from this work. And around that time, I came across a lot of research and I had a number of encounters which led me to think that maybe we need to reformulate our approach to ethics. Instead of framing it as a, a cognitive issue, uh, an ethical decision-making framework, you know, some sort of way to, to uh, analyze a complex situation, maybe we need to actually give people the opportunity to rehearse, to practice, to pre-script, to peer coach, mm -hmm. to build the, the commitment, the confidence, and the competence. And so that was the beginning of giving voice to values. Yeah, see, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned a crisis of faith first, which usually people think of that as a, a question in belief system. Um, but here it seems almost as if your crisis of faith was not a faith in what people believed, but in how people were acting on their beliefs. And it also seems that those who were able to speak the most, who said, you know, I know what you want me to say, uh, they were giving you an answer, but they weren't giving you what they believed. So how did you, in, in creating a voice, uh, giving voice to values, kind of mitigate those two, <laughs> two issues. Yeah, yeah, it's, really, it's a really good question. And it was kind of uh, an existential crisis of faith, right? Yeah. It's like, do I believe in what I'm doing? Do I think that it's even possible? And that is, in fact, what those people were doing. They mm -hmm. didn't believe it was possible to mm -hmm. do something. And that was stopping them from even thinking about how to act mm -hmm. according to their own values. And so I often describe giving voice to values as a pedagogical sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. So we kind of skip over the problem you just identified. And we use um, what I call the teaching technology we use. I call it the GVV, or giving voice to values, GVV, thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask you, what would you do, Ira, in this situation? Because if I asked you that, you'd either tell me what you thought I wanted to hear, or you'd give me that answer, I know what you think I should say, but it's not possible. Mm -hmm. Instead, I ask, what if you wanted to act in this way? Mm -hmm. And I give the values-based position that the protagonist in a particular scenario holds. How could he or she get it done? Mm -hmm. So what I'm enabling you to do is to think without that pressure of at some level feeling that I'm, I'm committing to something that I don't believe it's possible to do. And I'm mm -hmm. simply giving you the freedom to think in a creative way. We know from the research on creativity and innovation that people are more creative when they're not exercising that kind of self-judgment all the time. That's why brainstorming works, right? No, it's amazing the type of moral empowerment you can have by changing the question from what do you think you should do to what do you want to do? What do you want to do or just what if you wanted to do this? I'm not right. going to even ask you to commit yet, right. you know, because I want you, by the time you get to the point of committing, I want you to feel like there's something on both sides of the scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's an, there are options, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I know GVV started in business school education, but where is it being implemented now, and where do you see it going in the future? Yeah, it's, it's really kind of been startling to me and quite exciting. It's being used all over the world. We literally are being used on all seven continents now. Um, and um, although, as you say, it was created for use in, in business education and in particular MBA education, mm -hmm. it's now being used in undergraduate business education and executive education. Companies are beginning to use it. Major companies are using it. Um, we're start, starting to work with the U.S. military. Um, we did a project with the Australian police force. Mm -hmm. um, we've started to work with folks in medical and nursing education. We've started to work with people in legal education. We taught a course in an engineering undergraduate college. So it's being used quite broadly. There are even some folks who are experimenting with using it at the secondary level, mm -hmm. which I think is really quite interesting because the, the main idea, as you introduced in your, in your little preamble, Ira, the main idea is this idea of rehearsal and practice. And so to give young people the chance to not say, oh, don't use drugs or don't engage in risky sexual behavior, but instead say, you're being pressured to drink at the party or to mm -hmm. smoke a joint. How do you say no and mm -hmm. still feel like you're not going to be embarrassed or ostracized in some way? And so you give them cover, basically, to figure out what they could say and do before they're actually in the situation. And so they don't have to feel like they're being uncool to think about it. <laughs> well, no, are the, are the methods different when you're talking to adolescents versus MBA students versus uh, having it in... Uh, 
executive education? Because I could imagine that while the methodology may be the same, people have a lot of uh, different experiences and their ability to be malleable, let's say, and understanding a different frame might be much harder as their experiences increase. Yeah, yeah, so obviously the issues differ, you right. know, if you're talking about cooking the books in a business situation right. versus um, not engaging in bullying, you know, in a mm -hmm. classroom situation, those are different. Also, at, a, at a, uh, an older and more sophisticated level of audience, you can actually refer to the social psychology research, for example, mm -hmm. and the neuroscience research that underlies a lot of this approach. We don't typically do that with, with young people. Mm -hmm. but, with, but, but the basic idea of it is giving people a chance to, to do that pedagogical sleight of hand, to jump over the debate and get to what could I say and do. The idea of doing that in a peer group so you're you know, mm -hmm. sort of playing with your ideas together. The idea of voicing it out loud to your peers mm -hmm. and then peer coaching to make it better. That's all the same. Right. Um, but the, you know, the, the tools, instead of talking to people about you know, uh, Kahneman's research or something, right. you know, we may just talk to them about you know, what would be the immediate effects of doing this, what would be the, the effects next week. You know, we, we may talk about short and long term, but we're going to talk about it in a different way. Right. No, it's funny. I can imagine the, the neuroscientific and psychological research, research might benefit the scholarly community, the academic community of saying, oh, this works. I'm not sure how it works with regards to the pedagogy, because if you're just telling someone, oh, neuroscience supports this, I feel like they'll experience the benefits by going through the process more than being told that the process works scientifically. Yeah, so that's a really great question. So you're absolutely right on the neuroscience stuff. It's just a way people who are afraid to hope that mm -hmm. they can act on their values. That's my experience. Not everyone, but there's a lot of people who would like to act on their values and are afraid to think they could. And so sometimes using the neuroscience research just gives them you know, one more piece of security to mm -hmm. try this. But the other kind of research that we actually do find uh, instrumentally useful mm -hmm. is some of the social psychology research, which talks about decision-making biases and heuristics. Mm -hmm. So for example, we know that people think tend to discount the future and put more emphasis on short-term consequences. The way that kind of research usually gets used is mm -hmm. people will say, look out for this, watch out, you're going to be vulnerable to this, mm -hmm. watch out for groupthink. And you know, we also know from the research that just warning people about it or teaching them about it doesn't make them uh, immune to it. It means that I'll recognize it when you fall prey to it, but I'm still vulnerable. So instead, we use it differently. We use the behavioral um, science research by saying, look, People tend to think they discount the future, they're vulnerable to groupthink, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. These biases all developed for evolutionarily effective reasons. Mm -hmm. If you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, you're not going to think long term. Right. So, you know, this is good. It's not a bad thing. But it isn't necessarily applicable in every situation. But now that I know that we're, we all tend to think that way, when I'm trying to persuade you to do something that's in alignment with a values-based position, I'm going to name that bias and then maybe try and use it. So I'm going to not just refer to long-term consequences. I'm going to talk about some of the short-term consequences. If I think we're vulnerable to groupthink, I'm going to try and create an alternate social referent group so that we can start feeling like we're not alone mm -hmm. uh, feeling the way we do. So the social psychology and behavioral research is not, is not just useful in the way that the neuroscience is in terms of uh, justifying this work. It actually mm -hmm. gives us tools. Right. You know, it, it, I'm glad you mentioned this because this is, GVV is, is um, uh, a methodology that, that I think has uh, an answer to a big critique on Jonathan Haidt's work mm -hmm. where, you know, Jonathan Haidt talks about uh, how m a lot of our, our moral decisions are basically intuitive and rationalized afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they're rationalized, or they're intuitive first based on a lot of uh, biases and, and the environment in which one is in, and then the rationalization comes Close through time. the way we reason about it after. Um, but the question I always had with, with Haidt's work is, if those biases are unconscious or subconscious, once you do the research to make them conscious, wouldn't that now undo the ability to have them be your to be biases, uh, where you answer saying, no, just because I recognize it in someone else doesn't mean I recognize it in myself. But that's where GVV comes in and says, no, let us recognize it even within ourselves 
to be able to get rid of some of that situationist influence to be able to actually act on our values. Yes, but the only little tweak I'd add yeah. to that is, first of all, in case people are curious, the research I was talking about is by Max Bazerman at, at mm -hmm. Harvard Business School where he worked with a bunch of auditors and he, mm -hmm. he introduced them to these, these uh, biases and then found out what we just described. Um, but the but in what you just said is it's not just saying and you need to recognize it yourself, but actually giving you the assignment to rehearse responding in a different way. Right. So what, what I'm trying to do is to short circuit that sort of unconscious process. You know, it's uh, thinking, you know, the, the system one and system two. Mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to rewire that a little bit because mm -hmm. the reason we react instinctively in that way, I mean, those are, those are, it's, you know, the, the neuroscience would talk about, you know, our neural pathways and brain plasticity. I'm trying to rewire that by assigning you the task of thinking in a different way. So it's not just through self-reflection, because that isn't enough. Right. It's really through creating a new muscle memory. You know? Yeah, you know, um, no, I'm glad we're, we're, we're bringing this up in terms of making sure that, again, with the distinct skills of, of the deliberation and the action, um, GVV has seven pillars to it. And we, we just mentioned the reasons versus rationalizations. Can you give us a little bit of uh, a brief explanation of what are these seven pillars and you know, maybe pick uh, a few of them to go into a little bit of depth? Sure, too? sure. The, the seven pillars, and these are all they are, are ideas or concepts or principles that as I was creating Giving Voice to Values, I realized these were important foundational ideas. And so the seven are values, uh, choice, normalization, purpose, self-knowledge and alignment, voice, and reasons and rationalizations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I couldn't go into all of them in detail now, but let me just talk about a couple of them. In terms of values, you know, people will often say, um, you know, values depend on your, your cultural upbringing, your religious upbringing, mm -hmm. your family background. It's entirely relative, uh, relevant. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, relative, sorry. And, and relevant. And, and relevant, right. <laughs> um, and so this really, it's not possible to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. On the other side are the folks who will say, no, in fact, there are some universal values. I know what they are, and I really don't care what you think. <laughs> okay, so either of those positions, entirely relativistic or entirely absolute, um, sort of preclude the conversation we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What I will say, the principle for va of values in GVV is saying, look, um, of course there are cultural differences, religious differences, family background. But nevertheless, most researchers will argue that there are, in fact, some core values that tend to be universal. The philosophers call them hypernorms. Mm -hmm. The good news is there's some common ground. The other news is that it's a really short list. Right. <laughs> so what we will say with giving voice to values is when you encounter a values conflict, consider whether it rises to the level of one of these uh, hypernorms, one of these core values, or is it just a matter of my comfort or my preference, in which case we may have to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. But if in fact it rises to that level, then when I'm trying to influence you, to communicate with you, I'm going to try and express it, to voice it in a way that appeals to the value that we're likely to share, rather than framing in a language and terminology and reference points that are coming entirely from my background, my faith, my culture, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's how we talk about that issue. Would you mind talking about self-knowledge and alignment? Like, How do those two words go together. Yeah, so a lot of times when people will talk about values, they'll say, well, can you give me some sort of self-assessment values clarification tool mm -hmm. so I can figure out what my values are? And, you know, people use those. There's a lot of those, and people use them all the time, and they can lead to good conversations. But in the end, people do tend to come down to those kind of core values I was talking mm -hmm. about, you know, motherhood mm -hmm. and apple pie. And so what, for the purpose of GVV, what's more useful is to do a self-knowledge or self-assessment where I think about things like, um, what is my risk profile? What level of risk am I comfortable with? What is my personal purpose in my career or in my family? What's my professional purpose? What's the impact I want to have on, on my organization, on my colleagues, on my customers, on my world, um, you know, on my society, my profession? Um, we ask people, what's your preferred style of communication? How are you most effective? Are you mm -hmm. better arguing, debating, mm -hmm. or are you more of a kind of questioning, learning kind of, I'll position myself as the learner. Um, am I better in writing or in person? Small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And once people understand that, am I an introvert or an extrovert? Once people understand that, they can then frame the values conflicts they encounter in a way that plays to their strengths. This grew out of my experience because I'm an introvert and I'm so you know, I
situation. Mm -hmm. But when I started talking to people about times when they acted on their values, sure enough, the aggressive, assertive folks would say, well, I, you know, I'm a risk-taking kind of guy. Why not take a risk in the service of my values? But I also talked to people who would say, you know, I'm, I'm more cautious. I'm more risk-averse. I'm a fearful person. I'm conservative. And acting on my values seemed the safer route. And so what I realized is that, you know, almost any situation can be framed in a different way. So let's frame it in a way that plays to who you already think you are. Mm -hmm. If I ask the introvert that you've got to be bold, mm -hmm. you know, she or he, or, they're going to say, look, that's great, but it's not, not me. happening. Yeah. And if I tell the really assertive, hard-charging individual that she's got to be more cautious and more careful, she's going to say, you know, that's not who I am either. Mm -hmm. So we might try and find a way to play to your strengths. And in fact, in the Giving Voice to Values curriculum in pedagogy, we exa have examples of people who've done this in different ways. This is one of the ideas that I find is particularly appealing to students because there's always people in the room who see, the, and actually in organizations too, people, they'll come up to me afterward because they're introverts and they'll say, you know, really? I can do this? <laughs> you know, because they, it appeals to them to think there might be a way to do this that doesn't mean they have to become an entirely different person. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as you described GVV, uh, it's a very different type of education in ethics <laughs> than, your, than your standard education. Yeah. I mean, GVV makes you really look at who you are and what you can do in an immediate practical situation, as opposed to your typical ethics classes where you're reading about how other people think, not even about what to do, but even how to think about thinking or even framing just a question. Right. Do you see GVV as a, as a complement to the ethics education or a, re, or a replacement to it? I'm really glad you asked that because it's a, a, a frequent misunderstanding. Um, I tend to think of ethics education as having sort of three pieces. We build awareness so that mm -hmm. people will recognize issues. We teach analysis, which gives them models of thinking through problems. And then the GVV piece is then we actually help them think about how to act on it. None of these are, they're all necessary, but none of them are sufficient on their own. Mm -hmm. And I feel that ethics educators have developed really skillful ways of focusing on the first two. GVV is complementing that and building on it. On the other hand, in, in many circumstances, people already have the first two. If you're mm -hmm. in an organization, you've got a set of rules and you know what they are, you know what the laws are, and you know what your values are. You're an adult at that point. Then maybe you would put a little more emphasis on the action piece. But it is a complement. Mm -hmm. no, so I, I want to tell you, I, I read your book, Giving Voice to Values, a while ago. Thank you. Uh, and no, no, thank you. I, <laughs> I actually really, not only did I really enjoy it, um, but I use it a lot in my medical ethics training, I'm glad. Um, both for you know interprofessional education and uh, also just simply for the medical students as well. I find that especially for interprofessional education, it's hard enough to have people talk about their individual values, but then when they have values of, of a profession, not necessarily imposed on them, but uh, they need to find a way to acculturate themselves to a, a profession it's easier to show how values can be imp implemented when they start with their own. People are very comfortable with their own values. Uh, they just aren't comfortable expressing them in public or acting on them in public until you give them training. So I, I, I want to thank you very much for Pleasure. explaining a little bit more about GVV. And I, I really hope that in the future, uh, not only is it in education from uh, high schools to undergrad to professional to executive, uh, but it also uh, uh, has the expanse of uh, medicine, law, military, but also in family dynamics. Absolutely. You know, you, you, you see a lot of times where uh, the similar challenges of hierarchy in a corporation or in a business also happens in a family. Right. Uh, so you can find ways that even family members can give voice to their values for, for, for stronger both familial and communal development as well. Absolutely. So, no, thank you. Thank you. So, we have reached the part of our program where I recommend a book that can provide greater insight into the topic uh, that we've been discussing. Uh, this week, I want to recommend Behaving Badly, The New Morality of Politics, Sex, and Business by Edens Collinsworth. Collinsworth records what she has learned over her year of exploration into the sources and contours of today's moral landscape. Recognizing that today's ethics is grounded in the social mores of the past, while at the same time starting to radically break from them, she provides a picture that is colored by both historical context and contemporary interviews with a diverse set of individuals, each of whom demonstrate the complexity of moral living. With topics ranging from moral growth, as seen from the eyes of someone convicted of murder, to the influence that social media, 
scientific breakthroughs and innovative technology have on the ways we think about proper action in the boardroom and the bedroom, Collinsworth opens our eyes to the changes in society's perceptions of good and bad and challenges us to consider the ramifications of moving the line of right and wrong too far too fast. We will close each show with a maxim that we hope will provide a simple takeaway that keeps you mindful of the ideas discussed. This week, the maxim is, the bridge connecting one's thoughts and actions is constructed through many repetitions. We hope that with this show, you have come a little closer to achieving the good life.